What's so exciting about storage at AWS is that we're building at a scale that's just never been done before. Building at this scale allows our engineers to approach problems in a way that just can't be done at smaller scale. If we're gonna talk about storage at scale, the most sensible place for us to start is with S3. S3 was AWS's first storage service, actually launching about six months before EC2. Not that anyone was keeping score. In aggregate, S3 holds more than 100 trillion objects. 100 trillion, that's more than 10,000 objects for every man, woman, and child on Earth. And when we launched S3, we launched with a single storage class that allowed customers to read and write objects of any size and access them quickly, tens of milliseconds of latency. This initial offering was unique, and customers found many compelling use cases for it. Some customers used it to store and retrieve content. Some customers also found it a really convenient way to back up data. Other customers started putting data in S3 and using it as a foundation as they built large-scale data-intensive applications. Today, we call these data lakes. And of course, as the number of use cases grew, the S3 product team innovated to even better meet customers' needs. And one of the main ways we did this was by adding S3 storage classes, which enables customers to better optimize their cost and performance of their storage on AWS. For customers that like the ease of use of S3, but are primarily looking to back up their data, S3 introduced S3 Glacier and S3 Glacier Deep Archive, which enables customers to get a low storage cost in exchange for a higher latency retrieval. For customers using S3 for archival storage, this allowed them to achieve significantly lower cost while still getting numerous benefits over a traditional offline tape solution. And for customers with less frequently accessed data who cannot accept those longer access time, S3 introduced infrequent access. And since we launched infrequent access, many customers have told us that they want us to find a storage class somewhere between infrequent access and Glacier. An even lower cost offering for data sets like medical images, which where an individual image is almost never accessed, but it must be retained for a very long period of time. But when you need access to that image, you need it immediately. Yesterday, we announced S3 Instant Retrieval, which provides exactly this. Now today, I want to look at how scale and innovation make it possible for us to offer these unique storage offerings. And to understand this, we're going to have to understand a bit about a pretty old piece of infrastructure, the hard drive. The first hard drive dates back to 1956. And hard drives have been the workhorses of data storage for about the past four decades. And while SSDs have replaced hard drives in a number of places, in the cloud, hard drives are still the king of big data. Hard drives are mechanical devices. Internally, they look a lot like record players. They have a spindle and a set of platters and a motor that spins the platters between five and 15,000 revolutions per minute. They have an arm with an actuator on one end and heads on the other end and the actuator moves the arm to place the heads on the track and data is read from the hard drive. The physical engineering behind these drives is incredible. It's hard for us to appreciate it because everything is happening at such a small scale. But if we scaled up the hard drive head to the size of a 747, and we said that the platter was the surface of the Earth, the airplane would be flying at hundreds of thousands of miles an hour, and it would as it's flying, the pilot would need to count every blade of grass as it passed. So just think about how tremendous the technical engineering is. But as remarkable as the mechanical engineering is, the mechanical aspects of hard drives haven't improved in decades. And as a result, if you're doing random reads and write with a hard drive, you're doing 120 operations per second. That's the random access today. That's the random access number 10 years ago, and that's the random access number 20 years ago. But that doesn't mean that hard drives haven't improved. They've improved a lot. Drive manufacturers have been able to methodically increase the density of the magnetic coating material on the drive platters. And that means that hard drive cost on a per terabyte basis continued to improve. 
And this is why hard drives remain the best way to store large amounts of data when you need the ability to access it immediately. But when we combine the fact that drives are getting denser with the fact that random access isn't improving, what's happening is on a per terabyte basis, hard drives are actually slowing down. So this is bad news if you want to use hard drives for those use cases we were talking about a moment ago. So we're going to need innovation to figure out how to use them. But let's take a look at some of these workloads and the problems we would have first. So I won't say this is a typical big data wor workload. They're all a little different. But a lot of them look like this, where things are relatively idle most of the time, and then they really go when the data is being accessed. This particular bucket is 3.7 petabytes. And then on the peaks, when data is being accessed, we're doing about 2.3 million requests per second. So let's do some quick math to see how we would service this workload with hard drives. And we'll start with storage. A modern hard drive stores about 20 terabytes of data. So quick math, if all we cared about was storage, we would need 185 hard drives to store this data set. Well, that's not so bad. But what about I.O.? We know that each of these hard drives gives us 120 operations per second. And for the purposes of our quick math, we'll assume that every read can be serviced with one uh, operation. There's probably a bunch of reasons why you need more than one, but we'll keep it simple for this uh, conversation. So if we've got 185 hard drives and we can do uh, 120 operations per second, we're going to get about 22,000 reads per second at peak. That's nowhere near enough to do the 2 million peaks we need to service this workload. So we're going to need more hard drives, a lot more. In fact, we're going to need 19,000 hard drives to run this workload. And because we only need 185 of those for storage, we're going to be wasting a lot of drive storage space on those hard drives. Of course, we can have the opposite problem as well. This is a much bigger bucket with 28 petabytes of data. But the I.O. peaks here are only 8.5 requests, 8.5 thousand requests per second. So let's do the math for this workload. We're going to need a lot more hard drives for storage. In fact, we're going to need 1,400 hard drives to store the data. But as you probably guessed, those hard drives are going to provide a lot more I.O. than we need. Those hard drives are going to provide enough I.O. to do 168,000 IOPS. And we only need 8.5 thousand. So in this case, we're going to have a lot of very full but very idle hard drives. So now you understand why it's so challenging to use hard drives for big data workloads. But scale offers us an enticing opportunity, the ability to aggregate hundreds and thousands and millions of workloads. And by aggregating a massive number of workloads, we get a much smoother and more predictable aggregate demand. This is called workload decorrelation, and it's a huge benefit of scale. Now, while we can see the benefits of this at massive scale, how do we make sure that we avoid creating hotspots at the individual drive level? Part of how we do this is a technique called erasure encoding. When you erasure encode an object, you first start by splitting the object into a bunch of chunks. Then you're going to use an algorithm that generates an additional set of parity chunks. With erasure encoding, you can now recreate your original object with only a subset of these chunks. And you have lots of flexibility in which shards you use. We started using erasure encoding to more effectively achieve the durability goals that we had for S3. Because with erasure encoding, you can lose hard drives or even entire availability zones and still have the object. But as it turns out, this is one of those situations where you can feed two birds with one scone. Erasure encoding also lets us balance heat over all the hard drives in our fleet at a very fine level. When customers put objects into S3, we erasure encode those objects and store the shards on a diverse set of drives. And there are two big benefits to this. First, it means that any individual's data only occupies a very tiny amount of every drive. And so no one workload can create a hotspot on any drive. But second, it means that any workload is able to burst to the request rate of a very large population of hard drives. So how much do we spread out customer workloads? Well, a lot. In fact, 
Today, we have tens of thousands of customers with S3 buckets that are running on at least a million drives. So that means there's probably at least a couple million drive members here in the audience with me today. And it's also how we continue to differentiate the cost and performance for all those, those workloads that we talked about earlier. So speaking of scale, one of the things we invest in heavily at AWS is how we can make it easier for hundreds of developers working on massive services to quickly move without making mistakes. Now let me say that again because it bears repeating. If you want to innovate at scale, you need to move quickly and you need to do it safely. When you talk to most software developers about getting things right, the first thing that comes to mind is testing. But how do you test a massive distributed system like S3? Sure, you can test that your APIs work, but the challenge that afflict large-scale distributed systems like S3 are far harder to test. Storage services are huge, and they have to run in highly efficient, multi-threaded code. So you need to make sure that you don't have subtle race conditions, because at scale, the likelihood of even the most rare things is super, uh, it's super likely to happen. And you need to ensure that the system can recover correctly in the face of things like crashes and, no, uh, and errors. Because at scale, you're going to see a lot of those as well. And completely testing all the possible input and output states of a system as large and complex as S3 just simply is impossible. It would take millions of years, even if we used all the computing capacity in the world. And as you can imagine, that sort of test cycle is going to really slow down innovation. So how can we do better? At AWS, we've been using a set of techniques that are referred to as automated reasoning to help us prove our software works the way we need it to. Automated reasoning is an area of computer science that focuses on enabling computers to reason about problems and come to conclusions. When humans do this, they, we call the work proving or creating a proof. At AWS, we have one of the largest automated reasoning experts, teams of experts in the world. And this team is helping us transform how we approach security, availability, and durability. One of the ways we've been using automated reasoning the longest is for proving the correctness of distributed systems algorithms. These algorithms are complex, and they have a bunch of corner cases. So we use special languages to write exact specifications of these algorithms. You can see a few examples of the languages here. They look like other programming languages, perhaps a bit more mathy. But when we describe an algorithm in one of these tools, we can use, or one of these languages, we can use a specialized set of tools to reason about the algorithm and prove it doesn't have subtle design bugs. And then we can use additional tooling to verify that our code matches the specification that we presented. By doing this, we can, we can have high confidence that we got things right. But this approach requires a lot of specialized expertise and experience. So while we love the benefits of formal methods, and we use them extensively in areas like encryption, network protocols, authorization, virtualization, and durability, we find we are often faced with an or. What do I mean by that? On one hand, we can build a system with formal tools that I just described. This offers the benefit of achieving a really high bar for correctness, but it slows down development significantly and it limits the number of people who have the background and skills that we need to work on the system. Or we can forego formal methods and use modern agile software development techniques that we all love. When faced with this choice, the vast majority of software systems get built without formal methods. Now we started this section with the need for an ant. And so we've been asking ourselves, how can we turn this or into an ant. To do this, our teams have been using a new approach that allows us to combine formal methods with more traditional approaches. These techniques are called lightweight formal methods. The goal here is to maintain the agility of traditional software development while applying formal methods to critical components of the system. This approach also emphasizes designing the system from the get-go so that formal methods can be applied iteratively to more parts of the system over time. So how does all this work? Here's a place where we're taking inspiration from other engineering fields. 
The idea of lightweight formal methods is to create a model of a system you're building right alongside the production system, just like you would if you were designing a car or an airplane. Ideally, the model's written and maintained in the same language as the, the core system. And that way, developers working on the system can maintain the model right alongside the production system. Now, the model's an exact replica of the production system, except it leaves out all the complexities around scale, efficiency, recovery from errors. And if you've built these sorts of systems, you'll know that that's where these errors typically happen. The power of the model is that it provides the information necessary to establish the correctness of the system's design. And it also enables something called model-based testing. Every time developers make a change to the code, the model is used by a testing system to generate billions of tests that comprehensively look for errors. And this does not just test for correctness, it helps the developers find and fix the bugs while they're coding, which means developers are actually more productive with this technique. And over time, the model sets the team up to invest in applying more formal verification techniques to more parts of the system. So lightweight formal methods really do allow us to take that or and turn it into an and. The S3 team recently published a paper that, on how they used this approach to rebuild a system that managed the S3 hard drive fleet, the system we've been talking about here this morning. And as you might imagine, this system is a critical system that has to perform correctly. The paper was published at SOSP, a well-regarded conference for computer science research. And if you're interested in learning more, I would suggest you uh, look into the paper. But next up, I'd like you to hear from a customer who shares our obsession for improving customer experience. They've been leveraging advancements we've been making in AWS storage services to unlock new possibilities for creative professionals everywhere. Please join me in welcoming Brandon, Brandon Pulsifer, Adobe Cloud Operations. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. I'm excited to share a little bit about our journey and collaboration with AWS today. Adobe's mission to change the world through digital experiences has never been more relevant. As we seek new ways to communicate, to collaborate, to learn, and interact virtually, digital has become the primary way that we connect, the way we shop, the way we work and learn, even the way we're entertained. And at Adobe, we've helped pioneer and create three massive categories, creativity, digital documents, and customer experience management. And on any given day, customers and people around the world interact with Adobe digitally trillions of times, creating, collaborating, and sharing content. But as our customers innovate in these new and creative ways, they're confronted with an age-old problem, storage. In a world where we're creating more and more content and we're creating it faster and faster, we needed a storage class that can keep up with our needs to preserve and access both short-term and long-term data. So let me take you on a journey that I think will resonate with all of us a little bit. In the old days, the progression was pretty simple. We developed a roll of photos. We threw out the blurry photos, stacked up the good ones, probably stored them in a shoebox, Eventually, the shoebox is filled up and you put that in the attic. I'm reminded of this recently as we went about locating, organizing, and digitizing my 80-year-old father's boxes of photos and his carousels of 35-millimeter slides, for those who remember those days. And it's a lot of work. And today, we have a similar challenge, but at a much larger scale. Think for a minute about the professional, even amateur photographer. They shoot weddings, family portraits, company events, homes for sale. And every one of these photo shoots creates hundreds of videos and hour, hundreds of photos and hours of video. I lived this recently as well. During the pandemic, my daughter got married. After a lot of rescheduling and resizing the wedding and a lot of tears, our small COVID-style wedding at the end of the day still generated hundreds of gigabytes of photos and hours of video at the, that we all put in the cloud. But our little wedding is no edge case. 
Next year, it's projected that we will create one and a half trillion photos just in 2022. And that number climbs and compounds every single year. So our, our photos in the attic problem is similar. But now it's not just one attic. It's an entire neighborhood full of attics. And as our library gets larger, images get bigger, phones and editing get more sophisticated, it's not a stretch to say we'll soon outgrow the neighborhood and we'll have an entire city's worth of attics stuffed with content. And let's face it, the challenge then is how do you find and retrieve and share the content that you haven't seen for a while? So historically, cloud storage is focused on the two ends of the spectrum. There's good high latency solutions, like archival storage on one end. And there's low latency, quick retrieval options on the other end of the spectrum, typically at a higher cost. But that sweet spot in the middle was missing. And we wanted to provide our Creative Cloud, creative cloud customers with a way to store their assets and get back to anything they needed quickly, no matter when they created it. We needed a solution with the pricing model closer to archive storage, but the, but the performance and reliability and the latency closer to your hard drive. So we brought this problem to AWS. And we did that for a lot of reasons, but the primary one is our shared obsession with customer experience. You see, we knew that our, that our customers want to create a massive, even unlimited amount of content. They want to store it in the cloud and store it safely, but then be able to find it quickly and share it and use it even years from now. So AWS engaged with us. They met with our engineers. They came to Hamburg, Germany, where our digital imaging team sits. And together, they worked and collaborated to detail what our customers needed. And that leads us to today with Amazon S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. It's an AWS product, but it matters to Adobe, and it matters to our customers. This fast and durable storage is more critical than ever before. But this new offering allows Adobe and our customers to upload anything and everything that you want and come back to it quickly. But honestly, it's looking forward that really excites me. The ability to put more content in the cloud gives our customers a creative and a competitive advantage because it unlocks the AI and ML capabilities of Adobe Sensei. Sensei's content intelligence can look through, if you want to, your hundreds of gigabytes of photos and hours and hours of video and help you find what you're looking for. So maybe next time we can help Peter find the image that he needs for his presentation. Why does this all matter? Exactly for that reason. I recently celebrated my 26th wedding anniversary. And as that grew closer, I spent time looking through 25 years of photos that we had, trying to find events and experiences that my wife and I shared together. But I spent hours scrolling. Even when I filtered by facial recognition, it was still difficult to find the images that I had. We all have thousands of photos, and they're typically stored across our hard drive and our mobile devices, and some are in the cloud. And it took time. And how much more powerful would it be if I could simply say into my app, find me photos of my wife and I at the Grand Canyon about 10 years ago? and instantly have what I'm looking for. That's the power of Adobe Sensei. It enables you to focus on what matters most, creating, collaborating, and sharing your content. And customers can now do things that were never before possible. So let's come back to our problem statement. The impact that our collaboration with AWS has had is the ability to solve this problem. Glacier Instant Retrieval hits that sweet spot that we need as a storage class, and it unlocks an entire new set of capabilities. So when Glacier Instant Retrieval is paired with Adobe Sensei and Adobe Creative Cloud, we eliminate the filled attic problem. And we can enable and empower our customers, many of you, to do things that were never before, never before possible. You can access and use and quickly find and retrieve the content that you're looking for anytime you want. And that's truly amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. 
It's great to see how Adobe is taking advantage of AWS storage capabilities to innovate for your customers. Now let's look at another type of storage that's really important for computing, block storage. AWS offers a number of different block storage options, including a variety of EC2 instances with locally attached storage. We also offer Elastic Block Storage, or EBS, which is a highly available off-instance block store, or SAN. We still offer a few instance options with locally attached hard drives, but the vast majority of block storage these days is done on a different type of storage device, the SSD. The SS stands for solid state, and it's a direct reference to the fact that SSDs use media that's not mechanical, like the hard drive, but is rather solid state and built from silicon chips. By removing the mechanical constraints that we talked about earlier, modern SSDs can do about 1,000 times more random IOPS than hard drives. And while SSDs remove the complexities of the mechanical aspects, they introduce their own challenges. Flash is the storage media that's used inside of SSDs. As you can see here, Flash is an intricate 3D assembly of storage cells. These storage cells can be toggled between two states by applying voltage. But each state is used to store a binary bit. And while you toggle them with voltage, you can remove voltage and they're stable. So this makes Flash ideal for solid state storage. But there are challenges. When we write to Flash, we do it at the page level. A page of Flash is typically thousands of cells or bits. Now, this is pretty typical. It's the same way we write to hard drives. But once a page is written, it can't be updated without resetting all the cells. And resetting storage cells requires significantly higher voltage. And this higher voltage requires more wires, bigger wires, and special circuitry. So typically, Flash needs to be reset in much bigger chunks, typically thousands of pages at one time. And finally, writing a storage cell in Flash is a destructive process, so you can only write it a certain number of times before it stops working permanently. Now, you might be thinking you've been using SSDs for a long time now, and you haven't run into any of these complexities. And that's probably true, because SSDs provide a sophisticated layer of abstraction called the Flash Translation Layer, or FTL. And the FTL makes the Flash media look to the system like a simple random access storage device. The FTL maintains a mapping between logical addresses and physical addresses on the NAND storage. And it maps reads and writes to the right location, transparently moving data around to maximize storage efficiency. The FTL also maximizes the lifetime of the SSD through a process called where leveling. Now, this is no trivial set of tasks. And in fact, the F FTL is a complicated piece of embedded software. You can really think about it as a full-fledged database with some really specific optimization logic. But it needs to have internal transactions to make sure that it's both consistent and low latency. So it's a super complicated piece of software. And here's where things get complicated at scale. Each flash manufacturer produces their own SSDs, and these SSDs have their own FTL implementations. And some manufacturers have multiple FTLs on different SSD models. And just like regular databases, each of these different FTL implementations behaves a bit differently from the, from the next. They all provide generally the same API, and they all do a good job for the average case. But our experience over the years is that each one has unpredictable and idiosyncratic behaviors. For example, garbage collection can kick in at an unexpected time and cause I.O. requests to stall. And these sorts of unexpected behaviors can make it really difficult when you're trying to provide consistent performance. And they make it really hard to run certain workloads, like databases, that need consistent latency. And we run millions of these workloads for ourselves and our customers. So how can we get the performance consistency we need from SSDs? For those of you that have been to this keynote before, you may recall me talking about Nitro. Nitro is the reason that AWS got started in building its own chips. And it remains one of the most important reasons why EC2 provides the best performance and security in the cloud. We use a specifically designed AWS chip called a Nitro chip to create something we call the Nitro controller. Every EC2 server has a Nitro controller. 
the Nitro controller runs all the AWS code that turns that server into an EC2 instance. And there are a number of benefits to this approach. First, by running all the AWS code on the Nitro controller, we can dedicate all the system resources of the EC2 server to customer workloads. And this provides the highest performance for customers and it enables things like bare metal instances. Second, Nitro helps us secure our EC2 instances and provide unique security capabilities like non Nitro enclaves. Third, Nitro makes it easy for us to turn any type of server into an EC2 instance. This is why we're able to support Intel chips, ARM chips, AMD chips, Graviton chips, even Mac hardware. By doing all our network and storage virtualization in the Nitro controller, we also reduce variability and, and avoid interfering with customers' workloads, which improves performance. And these last two benefits, supporting any type of hardware and improving performance, sound an awful lot like our problems with SSDs. And so it probably won't surprise you to hear that we built a Nitro SSD. Now here we're zoomed way in and we're looking at the NAND storage flash under a couple of heat sinks. But if we zoom out a little bit, you'll see an Annapurna Nitro chip. Our AWS FTLs implemented on that Annapurna Nitro chip. So far, we've deployed a worldwide fleet of over half a million Nitro SSDs, built using flash media from multiple flash partners. Nitro SSD has enabled us to innovate on the performance and the features of SSDs at the same speed that we innovate on other AWS services. Nitro SSD is used to power the, the new i4 instance families, which are our latest generation IO optimized EC2 instances. Here you can see a Graviton based i4 server. These instances, the i4s, provide 60% lower average IO latency and more than 75% lower tail latency. And that's that variability of latency that's so important to running things like databases. And it's not just EC2 instances that are using Nitro SSD. Earlier this year, we launched a high performance version of EBS called Block Express. The EBS IO2 Block Express volumes are built using Nitro SSDs and offer the highest performance volume type in the cloud. IO2 volumes offer 256,000 IOPS with consistent sub millisecond latency. IO2 is a great option for running databases. Here you can see PostgreSQL runs significantly better with IO2 volumes. Latency is reduced by 30% and throughput's increased by 140%. And it's not just Postgres SQL that runs great on IO2. IO2 works great with SQL Server as well. Latency is reduced by 83% and throughput increased by 400%. This makes IO2 one of the best ways to run SQL Server. 